We are live. You're on mute. Rami, you're on mute. Sorry. OK. OK, hi. Hello, friends. And welcome to the second SY Young Professionals um, Conference, online conference, entitled The Ultimate Journey from Dumb Size to a Circular Economy, Best Practices and Innovative Solutions for Low and Middle Income Countries. So the first thing, let me share my screen because I have lovely um, slides for you guys. Um, so, so I hope you can see the screens now. So hi again. Um, so my name is Rami. Uh, I am a member of um, the SY Young Professionals Senior Management Team and a chair of the conference. So why dump sites? Um, so we all know that the illegal lumping of waste has become unfortunately a common scene in many countries despite its health and environmental impacts. Um, for that reason we decided to focus on dump sites and the journey towards a circular economy um, in this conference. Um, probably you might be asking like who are we? So let's start with a quick introduction about the ISWA YBG and what we do. So the SOYBG is a global network which was established in 2013 by a group of young, passionate professionals who are really keen to make a change in the waste industry and raise awareness about the waste management challenges in our world. Um, we are united by a common passion for more sustainable production, consumption, and, and waste management um, practice better waste management practices. Um, so, so far we have over 100 members from 40 countries. And if you are interested to join us, I would love to have you guys on board. So you are more than welcome to join us. To do that, you only need to be an ISWA paid member and, be, and your age should be 35 years or younger. So to know more about how to join us, please go to our website ybg.iswa.org and send us email and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. So in terms of our activities and what we do, so we have four main areas, let's say. First, we promote sustainable production, consumption and disposable practices. And we are here to share knowledge between different countries and groups in terms of best practices and success stories as we will be hearing today from different people sharing their projects and how they manage to make a difference in their communities. Third, we also here to collaborate with different groups and try to come up with solutions that doesn't only work locally, but also in a global level. And as we are a group of young professionals, so we work really hard with our members to help them to advance um, their careers. Um, so our journey so far, so since its inception in 2013, the group has been involved in a number of projects locally, regionally and internationally. And obviously we don't really have much time to go through everything. And I'm not going to go through what you can see on the slides now, but I would encourage you all to go through it, read it and look at our website to know more about our projects. So after um, the end of the conference, obviously, I'll be sharing the slides with you. So every year, um, we focus on a specific um, theme for our uh, projects. For example, last year, we launched a global campaign, and we called it What Happens to My Waste. And the main goal of that campaign was to raise awareness on the final destination of waste in different parts of the world, because we wanted to educate people about waste and where it's been disposed. And we, it was a really successful campaign and we managed to attract so many people on board. Like last year, we had 28 volunteers managing local campaigns in their countries. And our global campaign, especially on social media, has attracted more than 5,000 participants from 100 countries that they took part in our discussion and activities um, online. 
And as part of that project, we had a group of experts who, who got involved in answering people's questions about waste, how it can be managed, and how what are the best ways to dispose it. But that was 2018. But as I said, in this year, we are focusing on dumb sites. And the online conference is actually only one part of our um, whole flagship project for this year. We have another really exciting activity, which is a fundraising campaign, which was launched uh, a couple of weeks ago in order to raise some funding and help us to deliver our activities in this field. So I would encourage you all to support this campaign by sharing it with your friends and maybe considering donating for the campaign. And you can see more details online on our website. And also you can also you know scan the QR code you can see on screen now to go direct to um, the fundraising um, website. And a second project, which again might be of interest to many of you here, is a blog writing competition from dump size to a circular economy. How do we get there? So the book, because we would love to hear from young professionals from around the world, again, in, in form of writing, by sharing their ideas, how we can you know, get to that goal, which is having a, an economy, there's a surfer and we try to maximize the benefits of material there. So we have a really exciting you know, project here and really generous um, awards. So for the first winner, we will provide them with a full scholarship to attend the ISWA Winter Summer School in, sorry, the ISWA Winter School in 2020. Uh, for the second place, they will have a two year bed membership with ISWA. And the third place will have a one year membership. And the deadline for the book writing competition is on the 15th of August. So which means you have a month to think about an idea, a topic, brainstorm, and then write it in a really short blog and share it with us. And uh, to know more about the book writing competition and how you can get, submit your entries, please go to our website again, it's ybg.swa.org, or you can scan the QR code that you can see on the screen. So let's um, go back again to the online conference. And again, this online conference is being delivered here in partnership with POS Wise, and we're really excited to have POS Wise with us for the second year. Um, it's a really good you know, partnership. We're trying to work really hard to share knowledge and raise awareness about various waste management issues around the world. And the event and this online conference is a platform for young professionals and researchers around the world to share their knowledge and to showcase their work. So today and tomorrow you will be, you'll be hearing on different aspects and different areas you'll be having people talking about circular economy, dump size closure, we have innovation in waste management and also people talking about healthcare waste and how it's best to manage it. And yes, it is a two day conference. Um, so today we have a couple of sessions and also tomorrow there, there is another session. And as you might have already noticed, the time it probably doesn't work well for those who are based in Europe, Africa and America. But the focus here, we wanted to give a chance because as, as I said before, we are a global network. So we wanted to give a chance to our um, members in East Asia and Australia, chance to get involved. So we've decided to have an early session for them so they can join that call. So, but if you are interested to join, again, we have a QR code there that will take you straight to the registration page to sign up. So, um, so before we start with the conference, like this conference wouldn't have been possible without a group of young, passionate volunteers who worked really hard to put this together. So we had people from eight countries in different time zones, obviously working um, day and night in order to make sure that we deliver it in the best format. So I just want to say thank you to everyone 
who's involved in the um, session. And hopefully in the future, we can have more volunteers helping us in next year conference. I would love to have to see people who are listening to us today that may be taking part in next in organizing next year conference. And for now, I will give it to um, US Wise, Shweta, to give you a really quick introduction about US Wise. Thank you, Rami. And uh, I have to say that we're also quite excited uh, about partnering with ISWA YPG for the second year for the online conference. So let me just quickly tell you who I am. I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization addressing the need for knowledge dissemination in waste management. We try to bring in the best minds in the world together to build a global waste management community. Uh, we provide educational resources, direct access to experts, networking opportunities, and at large, try to build a momentum around the global challenge of waste. Uh, we also manage grants and provide consultancy services in uh, knowledge transfer and training, communications and content marketing, community building, uh, constant support, and of course, waste management. So uh, if you head to the video panel section of our website, you will actually see the other webinars and panels that we have organized, which covers the wide gamut of issues around waste management. We have panels and webinars that happen all through the year. And we have people from all over the world who come in as panelists to talk about the issues that, the, that are faced in their part of the world. So welcome to the webinar. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. And uh, I'm going to hand this back to Rami now. Okay, thank you Shida, for this introduction. Um, let me um, share the screen again. Um, so get back to business. So yeah, um, so now, um, oops. So I'm pleased to um, you know, introduce our first um, keynote speaker, um, Mr. Antonis Mavropoulos. He's the President of SWA, and he will be sharing with us his thoughts about challenges, the new emerging science, and the role of young scientists, and how we as young professionals can get involved, and you know how we can utilize our skills to address the growing challenges. And a really a quick introduction about Antonis. So he's the president of SWA, and he's been involved in solid waste management projects for. 20 years in 20 countries and has completed more than 150 projects. So his recent research work deals with globalization, mega cities, mobile apps, and the challenge of Internet of Things. And he has created the Waste Atlas, which is a global interactive waste management map that is developed in cooperation with various international organizations. And Antonis also has published and participated in writing of several books and scientific publications, while his articles have been translated in Portuguese, Romanian, Hindu, and Spanish. So before I hand it to Atos, I would just want to remind everyone, if you want to ask Atos any questions, please send them using the chat box, which probably you will see on your left-hand side. There's like a, a, an icon that indicates it's chat box. So you just type it there, and we will make sure to um, convey these questions at the end of the keynote session. And now, let me just give the floor to Antonis. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure for me to communicate and interact with uh, the Young Professional Group. And allow me to congratulate uh, both the Young Professional Group and Big Waste Wise for this excellent initiative. I think we need the more initiatives like this uh, more decentralized and focused on developing countries, customized not only in terms of time, but also in terms of content as it is today. However, I have gone through uh, your detailed program and I have decided to say something rather different. Let me explain why. I have seen uh, that just after me, Zoe will uh, talk about the magnificent experiences and projects they are doing 
dealing with the plastic uh, problem in very poor areas. So I also saw what we have to discuss tomorrow. So I decided to go on another edge. I decided to speak about the rise of a new science and the role of new scientists, trying to give you a very practical example and uh, an inspiring, at least for me, idea about the future of waste management and the work we need from new scientists. scientists. Uh, trying to, to explain this, I will also talk a little bit about what sort of new scientists, professionals and researchers we need, what sort of skills we require and what sort of views. So I hope you will enjoy it. And I would like to tell you that uh, what I'm going to tell, tell you right now, it's the first time I'm presenting. I have discussed it several times with a lot of people, but it's the first time I presented that I choose to present it to the young professionals group because I think they are the most suitable group for such ideas. So in brief, I'm going to talk about the end of business as usual in waste management about our interconnected world and the oceans of data we have. And then I'm going to go to the big data, the mobile phones and the new urban science that is already emerging. Finally, I'm going to talk about the new scientists and their skills. So let's start. I think it's pretty clear to all of us who are dealing professionally with waste management that we have four trends that reshape the future of waste management. We have climate change and global warming, even better that is accelerated and it creates serious economic and social impacts. This creates substantial changes, not only on how we evaluate waste management, but also on the business finance models. Then we have circular economy, which is linked very much to resource management and it brings waste management and makes it an integral part of the global resource management. Then we have marine litter, Actually, this is a big trend for the last four years that obliges us to rethink our relationship with plastics and to go far beyond recycling, not because we prefer another level of hierarchy singly, but because this is a necessity to save our oceans. And finally, we have the rise of the Industry 4.0, which is actually the digitalization of everything. Now, although we have four trends that shape waste management, I think that in practice, the Industry 4.0 is in the center of all of them. It's the way we will implement the Industry 4.0 that will determine if we are going to be able to deal with climate change, if we are going to deal with circular economy in depth, and if we are going to find innovative solutions and materials relevant to tackle the marine litter challenge. Now, these four big trends have to be combined with the more and more extreme weather phenomena, with a very short window of time to deal with global warming, with a huge biodiversity loss, which is more than 70%, with a rapidly accelerated ocean pollution, and of course, with increasing mountains of waste all around the developing world. I think it's not too much if we say that we are heading towards the end of business as usual in waste management, but also in environmental protection. We are heading very close to the area where small changes and gradual approaches, linear responses, are not suitable anymore because environmental degradation and health problems are rising exponentially. So a linear response is by definition not suitable, not proper to resolve the problem. And of course, if you want to see the big picture, this is very close related to the urbanization. All of you know the statistics about the urbanization of our world, and it's not too much if we say that the future of waste management is urban, which means if we are not going to be able to find proper waste management systems for the rapidly, rapidly urbanized areas, then waste management will not deliver solutions. And if the future of waste management is urban, then it is also very complex, as it is the urban structures, the social, financial, economical, political, and infrastructural structures in our rapid urbanized areas. 
which most of them are out of any plan. So this is why in brief, I always say the future of waste management is urban and complex, or it will not be a proper one. Now, this is just the big picture. And we are going to talk a lot about Industry 4.0 in our next conference in Bilbao, where ISVA is going to release its new report, How Industry 4.0 Transforms the Waste Sector. We are going to discuss what is our response. Is it enough? Is it simply to optimize business models? Is it a radical one? In any case, whatever is our assessment for what is actually our response, what I want to stress here is that Industry 4.0 goes far beyond optimization and new business models. It holds the potential for radical changes in the social, political, and economic uh, networks and for the development of a lot of new scientific disciplines. One of them is very relevant to waste management. I'm sure you all know that we are living in a really interconnected world. In a total population of 7.6 billion, we have 4 billion internet users, 3.2 billion active social media users, 5.1 billion unique mobile users, and we have also 3 billion media users out of the uh, mobile ones. Now, what all this means in practice, it means unbelievable amounts of data that are now available. So if you see what's happening in 2019 every minute, in every minute we have 1 million logins in Facebook. In every minute we have 18.1 million texts sent, 4.5 million videos viewed. You have like $1 million spent online, 2.1 million snaps created, and 14.6 .6 million messages sent by messenger on WhatsApp. We are living, literally speaking, in a huge ocean of data that is continuously increasing. And this creates new opportunities and new challenges. Back in 2012, I have written with my colleagues the report Mobile Applications and Waste Management, Recycling, Personal Behavior and Logistics, where we were trying to outline, just for a small part of this data, the data from mobile phones, how they can be utilized for better recycling, better waste management, and better understanding of the personal behavior related to that. I think now we can go much further than this. So let me show you some examples. What you see here is how we can utilize anonymous mobile data sets and their different applications. As an example, in this graph, you see the time evolution of the number of mobile phone users per hour during an average weekday in different Spanish cities. I have to stress that this is anonymous statistic data. And this anonymous statistic data is very useful because it identifies a lot of the hidden patterns of our social behavior. The time we call and how much time we spend in each call in different weekdays is an example in this graph. Then I want to move you in another uh, ocean of data, the data, we have, the data we have for Google location history data. You know, it's very easy to find your Google location history in your mobiles. And here in this graph, you see the typical uh, comparison between the data we use from Google location history versus typical data we use from census migration, cross-border traffic, and travel history surveys. As you can see, the data we can pump from Google location history, it's not only much more in terms of quantity, but much more refined in terms of quality. Because using the data for Google location history, in addition with the average speed, we can have a very nice idea what is the media we are using to transport. Using the personal GPS tracker, we can have a very detailed um, path for each one of us. And if we combine all these paths with the different stuff we take from social media, the check-ins, and the anonymized mobile phone records, we can have a very precise allocation of the traffic and transportation and movement of any population in any given area that has mobile towers or uh, huge or a good connectivity. Using such data, we are able now 
to create maps like this, not based on the spatial and urban planning, but based on the time people spend in different locations. So what you see here is um, a case study from Shenzhen in China, where we use all this data to find the spatial distribution of work locations and the spatial distribution of home locations in these two maps. In the past, to do that, we need to do extended surveys. You need to send 1,000 people outside and measure and make questions and fulfill questionnaires and then use them, put them on the database, and then use a GIS system to visualize it. Now we can do it just taking one month average of statistics from mobile phones. Using the same data sets also, we are able now to see the mobility patterns and the relevance with air pollution, as in this case, using mobile device uh, applications, or simply the mobile statistics. And this allows us to correlate the traffic of cars with air pollution and the human exposure on that. Now, I said this because the, the truth is that this type of data is already used for many, many other purposes. It is used for marketing. It is used to set up the traffic lights. It is used to, to forecast what will be the commercial traffic in specific areas in different times of the year. So it's very simple to say, but it's not done, that why we should not use this data also to understand better and in depth waste management, recycling, and personal behavior in neighborhoods, in urban patterns, in the whole selected areas. In addition to that, you have to, to consider that we have the emergence of crowdsourcing to resolve problems. Here you see two typical examples. Elsevier has created a lab notebook that step-by-step -step guides scientists to prepare, conduct, and analyze, and analyze experiments across the smart devices. So as to, soon as they are happy with that, what they are doing, then they can set up an application and do it with every device of volunteers. What you see below uh, with the type NASA Globe is an application by NASA. NASA has made this application that takes the location service and makes photos of the clouds from each user that uses this, this uh, uh, application. Now, by the way, the reason NASA did it is because the information about clouds says a lot about the evolution of climate change and the CO2 concentrations and interaction in each area. So if we are able to have 100,000 of such photos from different locations every day, we are able to have a very detailed analysis of how clouds are formed, which is very helpful, not only for climate change, as I already said, but also for weather forecasts. I'm pretty sure that we can develop similar applications for waste in a way you already have. But the point here is to understand the big potential. We generate every day huge amounts of data. And with the big data systems, we can identify inconsistencies and uncertainties and deal with them. We can make forecasts and uh, manage and identify trends in a very, very high speed sometimes in seconds, sometimes in minutes. We are able to combine different formats of data from various sources. And then, managing all this data, we are able to extract useful data that is not collected, but is an outcome of what we collect. And this is a whole new window of opportunity to understand waste management in a deeper level, not just on an urban level, or a country or a regional level, not just on a community level, but on a, on a neighborhood level, even on a department store level, or on a block level, and customize our interventions, our recycling campaigns, the way you collect waste based on this pattern. So I think this is not only about waste. This is the big hope we have to develop a real science of cities. You know, up to now, our science for urban centers is mostly based on conceptual models, urban planning, comparison between different patterns, but never on real data. 
And even when we have a lot of data, it's historical data from records. So you can go, let's say, to Bologna, and you will find out the detailed maps of the cities every two years. So combining them, you can have a great idea of how the city evolved in the last two centuries. But now, using mobile phones, big data, using real-time sensors, artificial intelligence, and big data systems, we can have the evolution of cities day by day, even hour by hour. We can have the evolution of population and its environmental impact quantified. We can make forecasts much more accurate, and we can substitute typical urban planning with dynamic planning approaches, going much beyond the, sta the static master planning we do till now. To put it in another way, there is a big hope that using mobile data and big data from cities, we are able to make complexity science a much more effective daily tool rather than a conceptual understanding of the patterns. I want you to see a typical outcome of this approach from the MIT Sensible City Lab. What you see in this video is the phone calls that were made during the last um, uh, World Cup final in Rome, where Italy was at the final, and you will see the red areas are the areas where many phone calls are happening. And actually, all these phone calls, if you see, they were coordinated at a time where Italy put a goal. Now, studying the data in details, you can find out where all these people were collected and why. And why in some areas it's everything red and even blue and light blue, and in other areas there is nothing. And then you can correlate this social behavior of movement during a match with the needs of the city, with the traffic, with the littering of the city, with the water consumption in different areas. This is literally speaking a level of detail we were never able to have before. It's the first time we can understand social behavior in such a detail. And certainly, we need a lot of research to apply it in ways but it's so promising that we will be stupid if we don't do it, if we don't start it right here, right now. Of course, some efforts are already in place. What you see here is from the city of Bergen. In this graph, you see the waste volumes during the different industrial revolutions. So you see that during the third industrial revolution, we had, we had a radical uh, increase. But then during the fourth industrial revolution, the peak is even bigger. In this graph, you see the main uh, topics of legislation and how they were related year by year. Now, most importantly, in this graph, you see that the more the waste volumes per capita and in total, the more the data we have for the users of the system. In Bergen now, they have roughly one million sensors on waste management for 500,000 inhabitants. Actually, they have something like three megabytes of data for each user of the system, which is actually a Kindle of 100 pages. It took them five years to compile this data from different sources to give it uh, uh, equivalent and similar format so they are able to cross-check and analyze it. But now they did it. They have created a new platform named Waste IQ and the outcomes of the data, which will be presented, by the way, in Bilbao, are very impressive and provide a much deeper understanding of waste management in a fine grain level. So, to summarize it, we are in front of the emergence of a new science of cities and sustainability, a science that can link material energy and financial flows, a science that can develop personal behaviors and number patterns, in accordance. We are very close to have the science of urbanization, and definitely this will provide a new view, new tools, and new methods to deal with waste management. Let me finish with some thoughts about the role of new scientists in front of this challenge. I think that understanding that there is such a science in front of us, we have to raise our ambitions. We have to rethink our skills, and we have to think deeper about what is useful versus what is trendy. First of all, we have to start from the understanding that all this new opportunity for a new science 
must make us more ambitious. New scientists must be sure that, yes, they can resolve a lot of the problems that they will take from us. They can go much farther than we are because they will have much more tools, much more technology, much more rapid innovation. This ambition is necessary to resolve problems. Otherwise, you just optimize what's happening. But we, we, what we need is not to optimize, but go beyond the available business models. You know, the great questions of the next century would be about artificial intelligence. All of us will use a lot of artificial intelligence tools, but all these tools will seem like black boxes. So the question will be, as it is written here by Tim O'Reilly, whose black box, bo black box do you trust? To deal with that, we have to understand about artificial intelligence that, as Hans Moravec said, it is comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligent tests of learning checkers, and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one year old when it comes to perception and mobility. Or, let me put it the other way around, we have to reconsider what we think about expertise. And reconsidering means we have to remember Nicholas Murray Butler. An expert is one who knows more and more about less and less until he knows absolutely everything about nothing. What I want to say is what we need is to restore the importance, the depth, and the urgency of systemic thinking. If we want to deal with the new industrial revolution, if we want to deal with artificial intelligence and the oceans of data, we must put much more emphasis on systems thinking, on systemic analysis, on systemic understanding. That means that you have to go a little bit beyond the typical expertise. And to do that, clearly, I think we need three key skills. First, we need scientists that will have the ability to create ideation, that they will have great creativity. Second, we need scientists that will be able to deal with pattern recognition much more than analytic estimations and calculations. And third, we need scientists that will be very capable on communication skills. These three skills, pattern recognition, ideation and creativity and communication skills, are the core of each new scientist that will be able to contribute to the rise of the new urban science, according to my understanding. And last but not least, a few years ago, I have written this article, why garbage men should learn more than bankers. And actually, the question is a little bit tricky, but what I want to say is that useful is not necessarily what is always trendy. Today is very trendy to say that I'm working in the financial sector, I'm a stock exchange analyst, blah, blah, blah. But actually, the service, the contribution to society of garbage men, it's much more than any banker. So it's time to reconsider a rebel against the trend. But we have always considered that we don't rebel against the mainstream only to conform to the underground, as Thomas Carnegie said. Well, I would like to finish with this. The scientists of the future should be, and are already, I think, as it is with some of you, much more intelligent than they are. Because intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, as Stephen Hawking said. I hope with that with these few words, I will be able to inspire you some deeper thought, more research, and more work on this emerging science, because I'm pretty sure your generation will be the first one that will use it. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Atunis, very much. It's really informative, really good insights about you know that new era, the era of big data, in terms of things. And it's really interesting to see that links between the waste industry and how we as professionals we need to, know, to do something uh, between the future of our civilization. Um, so before uh, we move to the second speaker, um, I just want to um, remind people if they want to send their questions you can do that via um the chat box which should be it should be under the main window so it's not the left hand side so please send your questions um the second thing the second point is that we're gonna share all the powerpoint slides all the presentation slides with you at the end of the conference so after the second day of the conference so for those who ask for this 
Um, so now um, I'm really pleased and honored to um, introduce um, our second speaker and friend. So Zoe um, Linkiewicz, she's an experienced technical um, waste manager and head of programs and engagement at WasteAid UK. She has 20 years experience as a professional waste manager, working in local governments, academia, consultancy, and as an advisor to government agencies, recycling businesses, and the global smart materials industry. Um, Zoe has led um, municipal waste and recycling programs, research studies, um, research studies, um, campaigns, training courses, um, and she's also the chief author of Making Waste Work, which is a free online toolkit for community waste management, uh, published in October 2017 and awarded the ISWA publication prize last year. Um, Zoe is project manager of a UK aid funded project in Gambia, where waste aid is training people in the coastal village of Conjure to turn plastic waste into useful products. Within two months only, the trainees had processed more than a million plastic packs. Really exciting story, and I look forward to hear all about it. So, Zoe, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Remy. Um, am I okay to start? Can you hear me okay? Okay, yes. I'll just assume that's yeah. a yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so thank you very much um, to the uh, International Solid Waste Association's Young Professionals Group uh, for inviting me to come and take part in your very exciting online conference. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, thanks to Antonis as well for the very interesting presentation that he just delivered. Um, lots of food for thought there. Um, I was particularly interested in... Um, oh, I need to share my screen. Uh -huh. Right, excuse me one second while I just deal with the technology. So I was particularly interested to um, to hear what Anthony was saying about the, the balance between um, focusing on waste management in wealthier countries where we might have access to all this um, very exciting data sets and so on. Um, and, you know, in, in comparison with what's happening in some of the poorest parts of the world. Um, I think it's great that more and more attention is being paid now to poorer parts of the world um, in recognition that without waste management, you know, what else can people do? This is more than half of the world are living in sort of relative poverty so uh, and don't have a waste management system. So we really need to be looking at um, how those communities can help themselves to develop sustainable resource management programs. Um, I'd also like to pick up on what Antonis said about um, the, the need for young scientists and young professionals in general to grasp the grasp the challenge of sustainable waste management uh, in the year 2019 and going forwards. I think it's absolutely wonderful and I want to congratulate everybody who's joined this conference today and also who's listening to it further down the line. Um, I want to congratulate you on, on your interest in waste management really. I think it's 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 a topic that's generally not considered sexy by most people, um, but actually I just I absolutely love working in waste. I've been working in it for 20 years, as Rami said, um, and I just find it a fascinating area. You know, it covers everything from individual psychology and behaviour change right through to global economics, biomaterial science and ecology, and human and physical geography, um, and it's changing every year. So um, I think it's I think it's wonderful that you're all here that you've chosen waste management as an area to uh, to focus your energy and and I hope to meet many of you over the coming months and years. So without further ado, I shall kick off my presentation, which I call Trainer Village Save the Ocean. So here we are. This is uh, our our um, latest trainees on the screen now in the Gambia. But the story actually starts. In Cameroon. So this is where this is Cameroon here, right tucked into the corner there of West Africa. Um, and our story starts with a young man called Pierre Camselon. So Pierre is here on the left hand side in the blue t shirt. Uh, this picture was taken in the mid 90s when Pierre was just a teenager. Um, Pierre was, um, he was 
he grew up in poverty. He wasn't born into any privilege whatsoever. Uh, you know, not a particularly happy home life. And by the time he was a teenager, he was one of those young men that lives actually on a dump site, scavenging for materials to sell to middlemen. Um, so typical to, uh, as with most scavengers, he's going for the more valuable materials. So uh, metals and rigid plastics, probably, um, certainly not flexible plastics. But Pierre, you know, he loved football, but he couldn't afford to buy his own football. So he played around melting flexible plastic in the fire and formed his own ball. And from there, persevered and persevered and ended up coming up with a process to make paving tiles. Now, here's Pierre a few years later, successfully running his very own business, making paving tiles just from flexible plastic, the LDPE, which is the low density polyethylene, the slightly stretchy plastic that is commonly used in shopping bags and the little bags that you buy fruit and so on in. Um, so literally just using that plastic, melting it down over a small fire, mixing in some sand, turning it into this kind of concrete like mix that when you put into a tire mold, it sets very quickly. It makes a really durable product. Um, this con these concrete tiles, um, these, these plastic tiles, sorry, they last a lot longer than concrete ones. You can drop them on the floor, they don't smash. You can drive a five ton truck over them. Um, they're absolutely brilliant and each one contains a large amount of plastic. So we'll come on to that later, it's, it's strength in, in pollution control. But Pierre these days, he now works with, we're very fortunate to have Pierre in the Waste Aid team. Um, here he is today, this was, well not today, but um, just a few weeks ago in the Gambia um, with Waste Aid, helping run our latest UK aid funded programme in which we're teaching people from the village of Gunju, which is on the coast, how to recycle plastic into these paving tiles. So this picture shows Pierre um, teaching people how to identify the different types of plastic. And we use different techniques. I'll come on to that shortly. So the Gambia, this is the Gambia. It's a tiny, tiny country in Western Africa, flanked to the west by the Atlantic Ocean and all around it on the land by Senegal. The Gambia is an English speaking country and it just stretches really along either side of, of a river, the Gambia River. The whole country only has a population of 1.8 million people. It's a very poor country, um, its economy is tiny, you know, having, having such a small population and, um, and just a lot, of, a lot of poverty there. There's not much in the way of natural resources and so on. So, um, you know, the, the young people who are living there, they really, they really need to find good employment opportunities so that they can, you know, help bring up their families and take care of, of their, their, uh, their ageing families. So this is our project. It's a two year project funded by UK Aid in which we are training 90 villagers and 24 trainers to turn plastic waste into useful products. So the 90 villages are comprised of um, illiterate older women, unemployed young people and people with disabilities. They're our target group. And then the 24 trainers, they come from a group in the capital city called Women's Initiative the Gambia, who we've worked with before. So we train them and then after the end of the project, they are then equipped to go and teach other communities how to turn plastic waste into useful products. In this picture here, you can see Pierre in the red t-shirt. He's showing people how to identify plastic using the float test, where you just cut a little bit of plastic, and put it in a bucket of water, and some will sink and some will float. The other test that we do is the flame test. So that comes after the float test, if you're still not sure. You burn just a little bit of the plastic because the smoke that each plastic gives off is very characteristic. So you can tell, for example, if something's PVC, you can tell straight away because the smoke is black and the smell is awful, compared to LDPE that doesn't really produce much smoke and smells kind of like candle wax, I suppose, when you melt it. So let's have a look at the project. Um, there's various aspects to the project. And um, first of all is sensitization. So by sensitization, we mean really um, awareness raising, improving people's understanding about uh, the problems of plastic waste, of unmanaged plastic waste in particular. 
So in the village of Gunjur, um, it's typical of many places around the world, with no waste management, people literally have no choice other than to dump their waste locally. Um, there's, so there's lots of small informal dump sites around the village. Um, or to set it on fire. So quite often people set their waste on fire in their own yard, you know, they'll sweep it into a little heap and set it on fire. Or otherwise, sometimes um, the waste that is taken to these informal dump sites in the evening, somebody will set that on fire. Um, and the smoke that permeates through everybody's house is just, it's pretty revolting and, and very unhealthy. So um, some of the impacts, for example, of burning plastic involve malnutrition in children which you wouldn't necessarily expect you know you wouldn't necessarily make a direct link between burning waste and malnutrition but it happens because so when a so small children they're not just like small adults you know their bodies are developing so they're very sensitive to environmental pollution and as young children are developing their intestines um, so after the stomach, the intestine is where um, your body absorbs a lot of the nutrients from your meal. OK, now the wall of the intestine should be very undulating. It should have a large surface area to enable your body to absorb all the nutrients from your food. But if you grow up somewhere that's got really bad air quality, i.e. somewhere where everybody's burning their rubbish, um, your, your lining of your intestine doesn't develop properly. So it develops actually in quite a smooth shape, which means that even if you're having a good meal, your little body cannot absorb the goodness from it. So these parents, you know, they're doing what they can. They're living in poverty, but they're doing what they can to scratch together a decent meal to give their children. But then unknowingly, when they burn their rubbish later on in the afternoon, they're undoing all the good that they're doing by trying to give their, their children a decent meal. So this kind of knowledge is really, really important, um, I think, to, um, to the, the, the people that we're working with in lower income countries. You know, what we've found recently um, in the UK, particularly, and I'm sure elsewhere as well, but suddenly it's, it's trendy um, to focus on the marine plastics angle. And I understand why, you know, it's a very, well, it's very poster friendly for starters. Um, but it's also, you know, it's a, the, the oceans are what connects us all around the world. So I can understand why um, why there's that focus and why that's suddenly become a popular message. However, when we go to these villages, we're not really talking about the harm that their plastic waste could do once it's in the ocean. We're talking to them about the harm that their plastic waste is doing to their own children. There's a thing called the Laszlo hierarchy of needs. Um, which says basically at the t you know at the top is you you, ba you need your your basics like food and shelter and then as you become sort of more financially comfortable I suppose then eventually you work your way down to I don't know trips to the theatre and things like that but you know if your if your primary needs aren't met then you're never going to have the chance to consider other other factors and other issues and that's how it is with waste you know so we when we when we're educating people and informing them about the importance of waste management we focus on the health of their children so that sensitization um, then we talked about uh, collecting plastics and sorting them um, as I explained with the float test and the flame test and um, also by eye and by touch and you know once you get used to it you can become very quick it becomes like second nature, identifying which plastics you want, which ones you don't want. But it's, it's actually the most important step of the process of making these paving tiles because um, different plastics melt and burn at different temperatures. We don't want people burning their plastics. That's the whole point. So they have to be able to identify the correct plastic, the LDPE, and that's what goes into the process. Then the making the products, actually it doesn't take long to teach people to make the products and literally anybody can do it. The older women in our group, they didn't think they'd be able to, but after the first day they were like, oh, that was easy. They were so pleased with themselves. So it really is a very no-tech technology that anybody could take part in. So here's some tiles in the, in the foreground there. Um, so once we've taught people how to, you know, why, why do it and how to do it, then we've got to teach them how to sell the product so that you can create what's called a value chain so how it works basically is that certain materials become pollute certain waste materials become a pollution problem because nobody wants them you know it's because they're sitting around there's no market for them like you rarely find that aluminium for example is a pollution problem 
because there's nearly always a market for it. Not everywhere, but in most places, there's a strong market for aluminium. But for flexible plastics, there's rarely a market. Okay, so what we're doing is we're creating a value chain so that when, because now the people that we've trained, they want that plastic. They want it. So it's not going to become a pollution problem anymore. It's part of the chain. As long as people are buying the final product, then our trainees are going to be, you know, collecting that plastic. And that's how, that's how, you know, you pull, pull the value through the community. So we um, do training in marketing and sales. Um, and in, so that's like our communications campaigns and so on. Uh, with the sales, actually, we don't focus on the fact that the tiles are made from recycled plastic. Uh, we just focus on the fact that they're much stronger, more durable than um, than the concrete alternative. And then we also do some budget management, or business management training, I suppose, uh, to teach the difference between profit and turnover and that sort of thing so that they can keep the business running sustainably. So here's, a, here's an area that you could park four cars on. And if each paving tile contains 200 plastic bags, in total, what you're looking at contains 132,000 plastic bags. So it's a really, really effective pollution control mechanism. We can make them in different patterns like this. We've got different colors. So we make the red by adding iron oxide, which is a, a powder that we add into the mix when we're actually making the tiles. Um, here we are, we've got, so this is innovation in action. These are our new products, uh, roof tiles that we made using exactly the same process. Here's some of our graduates, uh, the ladies at either side of Pierre. And these women can't read or write, and many of them have disabilities, but they can collect plastic, they can identify which is the right one, they can make the tiles and they can help sell them. So in that way, with, you know, we're really creating, um, creating employment opportunities in a really deprived community. Um, so they've got, a, they've got customers now. Uh, so like I was explaining, we've created that value chain. Here's some tiles being installed outside the local gym in the village, which is in a really central area. So lots of people are going to see it. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's not rocket science like I keep you know I, I always say to people we're not putting a man on the moon we're literally just helping people deal with their own rubbish and um, so it's a really exciting space to be in and I really recommend if you're interested please do have a look at our website waystate.org and um, go to the news section and you'll see all the updates there so I've just got a couple of minutes left so I just wanted to to pause and, and talk about your um you know the ISWA Young Professionals focus on closing dump sites and moving towards a circular economy um, there's some experience that, that we've had lately uh, working with some municipalities who are really keen to close their dump sites. But what we've found really is they don't know what they don't know. OK, so the capacity gap is the really key thing, I think, in my experience anyway. Um, you know, some countries have literally no waste management expertise, but it's not even the waste management skills. It's the ability to write policies for waste management. Um, go through you know proper professionally run procurement processes to make sure that what they're buying any equipment that they're buying like collection trucks or whatever are fit for purpose and they're not just buying whoever offers them the best financial deal you know and then regulation for example if they want to um build an incinerator um you know is there an environmental regulator in the country does the regulator have the skills necessary to actually regulate that kind of technology. So there's lots of things to think about there. And I think that it's great that the YPG has, um, you know, has taken on the challenge of working on this, uh, this closing dump size program. And I just, you know, I, I think that um, there's a lot that we can do in terms of sharing knowledge and obviously the B-Way to platform is a big part of that. So final slide now, um, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't share this slide with you. We currently have uh, our Waste Aid UK Aid Match program. This is a river in Cameroon where Pierre's from, and it's full of plastic bottles. So we, we're raising money to build a plastics recycling training centre in Cameroon. Um, so please do log on to the website, have a look, donate a few pounds if you can, and um, and also finally have a look at our toolkit if you're wanting to gain knowledge and understanding and the very basics about community led waste management then please come in there and take a look and to listen to the feedback. Okay, so thank you very much. I think I will leave it there. Um, cool, are you there? thank you. Got yeah, questions? thanks, um, <laughs> Zoe. Thanks, really inspiring story. And the beauty of the waste industry that you can see the diversity, like from Anton is talking about big data, in terms of things, to Zoe talking about providing basic waste management practice, you know, activities. 
but also although it's basic, but also it helps you know, in the environment, especially in these privileged um, areas. Um, so it's time now to, you know, for the Q&A session, and we have some questions. So with that question, uh, I'm gonna start with Antonis. So I have a question, Naveen, and she's, I mean, it's asking whether there is any waste management data collected um, using big data like system. And is there, have you any sort of project that use big data in the waste industry as an example? Do you want to know whether it's an effective way to use big data in the waste industry? Okay, um, I will answer by showing you two practical examples. So, example number one is this one. Sorry, this one. So, you see a graph, right? Yeah. Uh, this graph shows the filling level of beans in a specific area in Berlin. Uh, as you see, we take the signal that the bean is getting gradually full. Then, obviously, here it's collected and it's becoming empty and then it gets full again, empty, and stuff like this. Now, imagine that we have these graphs for each and every bean out of the 13,000 beans in the Berlin city center. So using these graphs, we have a very good idea of when each bean is 80% full, and then we can reorganize collection based not on a certain timetable, but on the level of the beans that are full and ready to be collected. So we can substitute standard collection procedures with a much more flexible approach, and wherever we have done this, as in Berlin, as in Sevilla, in Spain, as in Hanya and Crete, we have finally a 20 to 30 percent more efficiency in fuel, and we collect much more waste per, per kilometer in drive. Now, to understand how it works, you have to see this. This is a typical control panel of uh, uh, fill level sensors. So you can see that in each uh, bin, there is a kind of uh, tube that has some signals that show you how full they are. And then you can just make a selection of what bins are full in any specific time or 80% full. And then the system comes back with an algorithm that provides the best way to collect them with the less cost. Now, both of the examples I used I, I presented are coming for two sensors of beans. There are many other examples. However, I cannot present them because they are really commercial. There are big data sets from waste energy facilities, big data sets from MRFs or MVP facilities that are used to optimize continuously the operations. But unfortunately, they are not publicly available. I have some of them, but I cannot present them. However, I want to stress this. We have no application till now using big data sets from mobile phones relevant to recycling and waste management. And I think this is a huge challenge and we have to deal with that. We have to start focusing efforts, fundraising, and uh, setting up research programs about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Atunas. Um, so just moving to um, the second question, and we have a question from Wikasa in Kenya. And this question for Zoe. And they gave us a quick introduction, like, and it said, like, the last two weeks I've been in a field for consultancy on zero waste district in Tanzania. And we, which means the one who's asking the question, um, are starting uh, with Mohiza, the policy on grounds looks great, and we just landed a government tender for waste collection as a start. So I was wondering if you are familiar with this space, and I am exploring collaboration across the value chain and resourcing. So it seems they are looking for sort of like a final destination for in the waste once it's been completed. Um, Zoe? Sure, thanks Rami. Yes, and thanks for the question, Makisa. Um, it's a really interesting area that you're working in there. Um, a couple of things came to my mind. There's a, there's a blog post on 
policy, creating waste policy, written by another member of the YPG, um, Kristen Oldendorf, who is from Baltimore. She went and worked in Tanzania last year and wrote an excellent piece on policy, which you can find on the Waste Aid website. If you type in, um, if you go to wasteaid.org and search for local government, you will find it there. Um, the other thing that I would suggest would be to have a look at the Waste Aid Toolkit, which is at wasteaid.org forward slash toolkit. Um, and that will give you lots of ideas and advice on setting up value chains and understanding your different resources and the different materials and what you can do with them. So um, please have a look at those two resources and then feel free to drop me a line if you've got any further questions or you want to explore what we could do. Um, I'm going to be working briefly in, November, in Tanzania in November. So it would be good to connect and uh, and see what we can do together, maybe. Thanks. Um, cool. Thanks, Zubi. I've got another question for you as well. Um, so the question, so do you have plans to implement interventions such as what you're doing there um, in the southern part of Africa as well? And how can we engage um, your organization if we wish to collaborate? Like, Sure. OK, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, there's, so we've got a lot of interest at the moment in, um, in with you know from organisations wanting to partner with us, and as an organisation, we're at quite an exciting time right now in that we're finally um, managing to attract the necessary funding to be able to develop properly and grow and employ new project managers and, and really start ramping up our impact. So absolutely, we're we're very open to um, to forming new partnerships. Um, you know, it might not be that we can do it in the in the next six months, but in the next 12 to 24 months, I would expect that we'll be working on a lot more projects. So um, please do drop us a line. Um, we've got a questionnaire that we'll send back to you um, to find out more about your own group or activities that you've been doing and what you would be seeking from a partnership. And, um, and yeah, we can take it from there. So yeah, completely open. And also I would say that um, because obviously we can't, uh, we can't, possibly work with every community unfortunately directly uh, who gets in touch with us so what we do try to do is we always try to put our knowledge whatever we learn we put it on the website just get it out there get it out there so much in the way that be waste wise and the ISWA young professionals are all about knowledge sharing so are we um, so please you know keep looking there and sign up to the newsletter and um, because as soon as we learn something new we share it <laughs> okay cool thank you very much Zoe and thanks a lot let me know thank you sure my screen um so yeah so this was really um pretty good session but it was really useful and i hope like participants they you know have a good time and so yeah uh, that's uh first of all i just want to thank um Antonis and Zoe again for the really interesting you know insights and being with us today and having both of them that means you know the young physicians as a group you know has a huge role to play in the future so that's a really positive sign so thanks thank you both for being with us and I just another reminder about our second um, day in the conference it's gonna be tomorrow it's really early but if anyone is interested or can do it so I would encourage you all um, to join because we have a really interesting you know presentation from Rashi she will be talking about the plastic industry in India and how they came up with a really innovative way to address that challenge in India so if you, if you want to sign up, just go to our website or scan the QR code. And now, without any further ado, I would like to hand over to my friend and colleague, Natalia Lima, who will be moderating um, the second part of this um, day. So Natalia, could you first like give a short introduction about yourself and then you can choose our first speaker. Thanks, Natalia. Hello everyone, I'm Natalia from Brazil. I am a founding member of the ISVA YPG and I've been collaborating with the research group since this January. Um, well, I'm now currently doing my master on plastics recycling chains and I have been working with prevention and uh, recycling, especially with the informal sector in Brazil since uh, 2012. So before we start the presentations, I would like to mention uh, for our audience that there will be a question and answer session at the end of all the presentations. You can submit the text 
questions uh, in the attendee interface in the chat. Please mention your name and state to which presenter you, you like to forward your question. So now I would like to welcome the first presenter, Davis van de Ayreri from Kenya, whose presentation title is Closing Nutrient Cycles, Upscaling of Black Soldier Fly Treatment in Nairobi. Davis is a research and development specialist at Synergy. He holds a master in horticulture and plant health, and he has been working with innovative ways of managing the much uh, organic waste generated and not appropriately disposed of in Nairobi. So Davis, welcome. The floor is now yours. Hi, everyone. Um, as I try to share my screen with you, Um, I, th I think you need to share it from that chat window first before sharing it from your PowerPoint. So you need to go to the internet browser and share your screen first. Okay. Yeah, so I'm doing that right now. Oh, some problems arising. The share button is not active, but I'm trying to. Yeah, it's now live and. Uh, um. Yeah, now I'm, okay, yeah, I'm exactly, sharing. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Thank I've, you. Uh, yeah, I've shared my screen with everyone, and uh, I'm going to start uh, this presentation by welcoming you all from uh, this side of the world, Nairobi, Kenya. It's uh, in the eastern part of uh, uh, Africa. And today, uh, I'm going to give you our research findings on our project, which we are currently doing, which is titled uh, Upscaling of Blood Soldier Fly Waste Treatment by Closing in on the Nutrient Cycles. Sanaji is an organic waste recycling uh, located in Nairobi city. Just to start with a brief introduction of where we come from, Nairobi is one of the Af uh, one of African fastest growing cities. It is known as land uh, of the Lion King, as you might all know. This is because it's the only city with a national park right next to it all over the world. It's also known as uh, the green city in the sun. This is because of its lush green sceneries uh, next to it just under the equator. More to that, and on the negative side, is that in any booming city as Nairobi is, a lot of waste is generated. In a single day, all uh, in the city, we produce, all the residents of Nairobi produce over 2,000 tons of organic waste. That is daily. More to that, 66% of this waste, which is sanitation waste, is never safely removed or treated. The World Bank uh, envisages that by 2050, waste production will go up by 70%, and this will not spare Nairobi either. However, we at Sanaji believe there is an opportunity to repurpose this waste into valuable agricultural inputs. That is why we have come up with a circular economy to solve waste management uh, challenges in Nairobi and any, in any other emerging city. What do we do in our model? We collect waste, from our network of toilets, specialized toilets to say, installed in unsewered parts, parts of Nairobi, and also organic waste from, uh, fr from agricultural processors, hotels, and restaurants within the city. We then safely transport that waste to a treatment facility, which is uh, out, out of Nairobi, and then treat that waste by converting it into valuable products, that is agricultural uh, organic fertilizer, and a high in, a high protein insect insect feed. So how do we, how do we convert this waste? We use a, an insect commonly known as the black soldier fly. Let me briefly explain how black soldier fly works. 
this is a is a com is a common widespread fly which is widespread all over the world and uh, this fly just as any other fly undergoes a normal life cycle it lays eggs and we rear a thousands uh, thousands thousands if not millions of these so they the flies lay eggs which we then uh, rear, which then hatch into young larvae which we rear in a nursery and then after that we uh, after 5 to 10 days we then put this young larvae uh, for which which we have reared in the nursery to a bed of carefully uh, carefully mixed sanitation and organic waste we collected through the city the larvae is a ferocious feeder at this stage so at this stage it is able to convert the nutrients in the waste into valuable proteins and fats and then after 10 days of feeding we harvest sterilize uh, this the larvae and dry it and then we package it as a high protein insect feed which is later all which we are trialing trialing to see if it can replace the conventional protein sources in kenya which include fish fish meal and uh, and soy today we are processing over 20 tons of waste daily and producing over five tons of dry larvae every month building on the successes of the, uh, building on the successes of our current facility we are now scaling up our operations we are building the biggest organic waste processing facility in east and central africa this facility will be producing over 200 tons of waste we will be processing over 200 tons of waste daily and producing about 300 tons of dry product per month from our previous trials we have seen that the type of waste and the nutrient content or the quality of waste greatly affects how blood soldier fly reduce the waste as you can see from this graph the better the waste the more it is reduced by black soldier fly so that is why we're incorporating this learning into a model which will which will which will help us come up with bsf formulations to incorporate all the variabilities in this waste our our criteria which we are using is that we must at least uh, treat minimum of 30 percent of sanitation waste because this is a uh, part of our mandate to collect and treat waste we have we have collected from the network of toilets we have installed in Nairobi and Seward areas. Secondly, this waste must be rich in utilizable nutrients by the larvae. This waste must be rich in carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids in the final in the final mix, which is in a final formulation for the larvae. This waste must be reduced greatly or must offer high potential for waste reduction by the larvae. And then also the landing cost of this waste must be reasonable enough for to, to help us uh, to help us scale our operations and the waste must be available in great quantities black soja fly uh, a larvae production for animal feed is an emerging industry as i said to replace conventional protein sources that is uh, fish meal and uh, and soy and what we envisage is that leaders, leaders in this market will differentiate themselves thanks to the high nutrients recycling from waste. So how do we best incorporate this waste performance variability and availability in our process to ensure as we scale, we attain sustainable growth? We undertook a project which had four key steps to address this. The first step involved bio waste assessment, and this entailed going out into the vast city of Nairobi, mapping out the amounts of waste streams and the types of waste streams available, the competing users and the costs. Second, uh, secondly, after mapping all these waste streams available, we took samples and, um, uh, and took them to the lab for nutrient characterization. Here we were looking at the nutritive and the unnutritive values from the waste streams identified in reference to black soldier fly larvae feeding. Thirdly, from results uh, from, from results from uh, step two and step one. We then did formulations, that is making BSF diets for the larvae and did experiments with them. Here, we now fed those formulations, all the final mixes of the waste streams, putting into consideration step one and two. Uh, we fed them to the larvae and observed how larvae perform in terms of the key metrics of measuring, uh, measuring, uh, measuring larvae growth. And then uh, the fourth step is facility implementation, whereby we are looking at 
at transferring our, our results from step three, step three to our large scale facility to check the cost efficiency of the process and the, if we are if, if we attain consistent consistent performance uh, from from our small scale small scale trials in um, in in step three. Let me give you a bit of, of the results. We found that Nairobi produces a lot of waste, and there are very very many waste streams available. However, this waste is never all availed to the lavi, and most of it finds it, its ways into the dump sites and landfills. Also, we identified that a lot, some of the waste which, is, which we deem quality waste at this stage attracts a lot of competition from other industries like the, the, like the pig industry, which buy this food to, to, feed, to feed to their pigs. Also, different kinds of waste add different costs to, to, to land to a, to, a, to a treatment facility, but key in, keying in into our, into, our, into our top four waste streams identified, we, 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 we keyed into fruits and vegetables, pig manures, food waste, and sanitation waste. This is because, as you can see from this table, they offer a lot of quantity out there in the city. When we went to the second stage of nutrient characterization, it helped us characterize the, characterize the waste or classify the waste into three classes. That is the nutritious class, the moderately nutritious, and the non-nutritious class. The highly nutritious class, as I am now highlighting in blue, is a, a class of waste which contains a lot of proteins, lipids, and hemicellulose, which we are using as a proxy of carbohydrates. This class includes the hotel waste, canteen waste, kitchen waste, and any other food waste available in Nairobi. However, as seen from the previous slide, apart from it being of good quality, for the lavi, for, for the lavi, it attracts a lot of competition. Secondly, the moderately nutritious class, as I, I, have, I am highlighting in yellow, this class contains less of the proteins and lipids, some of the uh, carbohydrates, that is the hemicellulose, and then also less of fibers and ash. This class includes the the fruits and vegetable, which is produced by by many agricultural processors within the city. This class offers a lot of availability and uh, also mean, uh, and also some quality, as I have explained from, the, from, from this graph. The third class, which is the non-nutritious class, contains more of the unnutritive values in, term, in reference to larvae feeding. This is, it has a lot of fibers and a lot of ash. This class, uh, this class includes mostly the manures and the, and the sanitation waste we collect. However, it lies within our mandate to, to, to treat, uh, within our mandate to treat, collect and treat sanitation waste from our, our network of specialized to toilets in Nairobi, and seward areas, and also it offers a lot of quantity. From this then, we went to Sorry, check- Sorry, Davis? Yes, um, Yes, please, can you finish in two minutes, please? Okay, two I'm minutes. almost done, yeah. Yeah, so after that, we went to formulate for BSF diets where we are looking at maximum utilizable nutrients. We, here we formulated for maximum lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And we observed that the more the utilizable nutrients, the better the larvae performs in, terf, in terms of bioconversion rates and also in terms of larvae growth. Recipe 5, which I've highlighted in yellow, had the maximum amount of utilizable nutrients and offered the best bioconversion rate and also the best larvae growth. Now we are currently working on transferring these results into a full-scale facility. And key conclusions we can we, we can get from this study which we have done in Nairobi is that a lot of organic waste is generated, but not all or not all is available to BSF as it goes most most of it goes to dump sites and the landfills and other undesignated areas. Secondly, the second conclusion is that quality waste can be highly contaminated with inorganics, as we have seen from our from our service. And third, waste available in high quantities has low nutrients, and hence formulating for black soja fly larvae feeding diets can balance off this factor to increase the efficiency in nutrient recycling. And this is key in setting up a with, uh, and, uh, and scaling up a waste organic waste recycling facility using black soja fly technology. Thank you all for listening in, and I would like to thank my colleagues from Sanaji, collaborators from University of Zurich 
and UVAG, and I'm now open for any questions whenever they arise. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for your presentation. It's very important to deal with the organic waste, as in most of the developing countries, is usually half or more of the problem, and and we are usually discussing on on recycling and the packaging, but organic waste, food waste, is is a big issue as well uh, concerning the, the the dump sites. So thank you so much for your presentation. Just to remind everyone, you can still submit your questions in the chat box. And uh, at the end of all the presentations, we'll have the, the Q&A uh, session So we, we with all the presenters. So just you can post your questions from now on to the last presentation. And then on the Q&A session, we will we'll answer all of them, OK? So, so next. Uh, we'll now be hearing from Bordeaux, Pierre Georges from France. Um, his presentation is on uh, H2S used as tracer gas to reduce impact of dump site on human health. Uh, the case of uh, True Tears landfill in Haiti. Uh, Verdieu is a PhD student at the University of the of the French West Indies. He's the founder and president of the G GCs organization, which works in the field of education, health, entrepreneurship, and environment in Haiti. So, Verdio, the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, I think you have to unmute yourself and then share your screen. Um, so first, Davis, you can stop your, your screen. Yes, thank you. And now Verdu can start uh, the screen share and unmute your microphone, Verdu. Verdu. Yeah, there you go. Hi, everybody. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, can you I... share your screen? Okay. My screen? Do you hear yes. me? Yes, we hear you. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, Vardo, we can hear you. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I try to, to share my screen. Yeah, please do that. Okay. Uh, I, I can I can share my screen. Hello. Uh, yeah, Brodo, you can share your screen. It's uh, it's the second button to your left. Uh, I can't use the button to share. So uh, there's a button before, uh, below the chat button is a, is a green button. It's called screen share on the left. The bottom is good. The bottom is good. Hey, uh, Verdu, do you have the webinar running in the background by any chance? Because I can hear the uh, noise voices again. Just keep the screen open. 
yeah, uh, uh, Natalia, do you think we could move to another speaker in the meantime? Burdo could be ready. Okay, so let's move to Rem. Uh, Rem Abikil from Palestine. I'm with you, yeah. Okay, so her presentation is on the evaluation of pilot medical waste management practices in Middle and South Gaza. Uh, just a second, uh, Verdo, you can mute yourself, please, for now, and I'll call you up again. So Rem is an environmental specialist. She holds a master in environmental engineering, and her areas of expertise include environment, health, and safety compliance standards, for infrastructure projects and uh, project management. So you can start your presentation, Rem. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, so happy and I'm glad to present mm -hmm. in front of you today. And I'm very happy also to hear about my uh, colleague experiences in different parts of the world. Uh, so I'm talking today about the evaluation of the pilot medical waste management practices in Middle and South Gaza. So uh, where is Gaza? Gaza is located in the southwest uh, of uh, Palestine. And uh, there is around 2 million people living in Gaza in a very small area. It's around 360 square kilometers. While the solid waste generation is expected to rise from 1,500 ton in 2012 to around 3,000 ton per day in 2040. And in Gaza, we are suffering a lot from the solid waste management uh, sector. We have only uh, three landfills and it's already uh, reached to their capacity. But today I'm talking about the medical waste sector, which also a big challenge here to the people in Gaza, because in the medical waste here, we are not separating the waste properly, and we it just dumped with the municipal solid waste and disposed in the normal containers, and which of course uh, it causes uh, risk to the public health and uh, the people are surrounding the, especially the health centers. And the problem that we are facing that only 80% of the medical waste generated from the health centers is normal waste, but because it's mixed with the 16% of the infectious waste, so the whole quantity became so infectious and so risky. And here is a photo of the waste dumped in the open landfills without any proper uh, treatment. And uh, we use in Gaza only the treating the sharp medical waste uh, using the incinerators. However, we have two incinerators in Gaza in a bad conditions, and also it's mixed with the normal waste. So there is a study held by JICA in Gaza studying the situation of the medical waste, and uh, we have around 182 health centers in Gaza generating around 7,000 ton is seven, sorry, 7,000 kilogram per day of medical waste. And only 10% to 20% of this total amount is infectious waste, which, which means only 1,000 kilogram per day is infectious, which need a proper treatment. So uh, there is a new system, uh, a new system uh, improved uh, for improvement for the medical waste sector in Gaza. This system introduced the three uh, categories: separation for the medical waste, infectious, and sharps, and the normal waste. And the strategy is to transfer this infectious and sharp waste, medical waste, to the proper treatment facilities, either by incineration or autoclave. And after the treatment, it should go to the final disposal sites why the normal waste should be separated from the other parts of the medical waste and collected normally to the sanitary landfills. The first phase we are calling intra-hospital management, while the second phase we call it off-site management. So here the objective of this study is to evaluate the intra-hospital management for the new strategy held in the Gaza. So the study uh, was uh, carried out over 37 uh, clinics in South and Middle Gaza. Here is the map of the distribution of the study uh, clinics. And uh, we, wait, we took the weight of the waste generated from each clinic to study the generation quantities per outpatient. So we conduct site visits, questionnaires, and interviews. And the treatment was, the major treatment was using the autoclave. This is the new strategy of improvement. 
So the study, the results was uh, here in from February. We start, we make the study from February until April this year. And the quantities, as you see from the screen of infectious and charged medical waste, around 1,000 kilogram per month. While the generation per outpatient, it was around 10 gram per outpatient, which was also listed in the in the assessment study about 14 grams. So we are improving our segregation system in the medical health centers. And also the study made an, a questionnaire to study the level of uh, source segregation in the, of the medical waste. And around 80-40, 84% of the health centers, they are segregated the waste and they are putting the colored bins available in the probal, uh, probal places. While uh, 27 or, or almost 73 percent, uh, they are segregated segregate the sharp and fictitious in a proper way, and 78 percent of the health centers they are using a good coded bags to segregate the waste, as you see from the picture. While they also the questionnaire asked the level of transportation, the bags almost all the health in the whole the health centers, the transportation, they are transport the waste in a separate route and in a separate timing. However, almost 50% of the targeted places they are using the wheeled uh, trolleys for transporting the bags from inside the health centers to the storage rooms. And also the questionnaire asses the level of the storage facilities. Uh, unfortunately, around 38% 38 of the targeted places, they have a separate rooms for storing uh, the waste. And only 20%, 20, 70, 27%, uh, they have the embryable for water. They are a good condition for the storage of medical waste. And only 40% say they have the look to, uh, to uh, close the storage rooms for the medical waste, and only 32% they are using the weight balance uh, for uh, weighting the medical waste generated from inside the health centers. And uh, only 46% 46 of the targeted places, they are not storing the medical waste over than 48 hours. And also the questionnaire asked the current practices about among the waste handlers and the waste uh, uh, the waste people who's who's dealing who are dealing with the waste inside the medical centers. All of them, I I noticed that all of them they are aware about the risk of the medical waste and the hazardous. And all, almost all of them they attend the special training how to deal with the waste. But still, they are not following the uh, they are not following to wear the personal protective equipment. Like I found. Around 50% of, of them, they are using the gloves while they are transporting the bags to the storage rooms. Around 80% they are using the apron during their work. None of them, they are using the mask and none of them, they are using the goggles. And also only 40% they are using the footwear during their work. So the conclusion of the study that uh, the majority of the, the places of the target health centers, they are following in a good way the new strategy uh, using the colored bins in the uh, proper places. And the majority of the waste handlers were aware enough about the hazards of uh, dealing with the waste. However, uh, during the site uh, visits, many uh, new graduates and medical doctors uh, they have a very limited experience in the segregation of the waste, so it was really recommended to train to train these new staff in a periodic um, uh, basis and to keep the monitoring and evaluation visits to the other and these target uh, health centers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ram, for your presentation. Um, I would like to remind the audience now that they can send their questions in the chat box um, to Rem and to all the other presenters. So now we carry on with the presentations. Uh, let's go back to Verdu. Let's try again. Verdu, are you there? You have to unmute. There you go. Okay. And now, can you share your screen? Now, I can share the screen. Reem. 
Oh, sorry. Can you share your screen with the green button? I try. I, I try. I, I try now. I can share. The button share is, 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 is it's not I working. Can, it's not working. The button share. I don't know why. And then I try. I try again. Um, would you be know. able to present without without the presentation? Just. Oh, okay. So yeah. we will share your slides um, um, through Be Waste Wise. So you can send. Can you send us your your slides? Yes. And and while you do that, so let's move on to the. Oh, you have them. Can, sh, sh, will we will we do it now? Uh, um, Tana, let's let's keep it to the end. Uh, in the last presentation, and I can just share his slides, and he can do the talking. Okay. So, so let's move on. Sorry, Verdu, you're gonna be the the last one. Okay. So, uh, while we set it up, so uh, let's move on to the fourth presenter, uh, João Pinto Cabral Neto. He's from Brazil. His presentation is gonna be on resource recovery from post consumer post consumer lead. Uh, lead acid batteries. João is a PhD student at the Federal University of Pernambuco. He is also the chief engineer in the battery factory Moura. He has been nominated the best project manager in the state of Pernambuco for two consecutive years, 2017 and 18, um, by the Pro Project Management Institute. And he's also working as a university professor. So, João, welcome. And you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure being here today. Um, just a minute that I will share my presentation. Everybody can see. Yes, carry on. Okay. Uh, you have 10 minutes, please. Okay. Um, so I will present my study that the title is Resource uh, Recovery from Post-Consumer lead -ass Batteries. So uh, waste electrical and electronic equipment, as known as waste, is one of the fastest growing problems for the world, due to serious future concern over its management and recycling. Lead as battery labs are a type of electrical equipment consisting of a polypropylene case containing lead plates immersed in acid sulfuric and electrolyte with similarities with to some electron ketones they have short life cycles and toxicity science lead lead is the pervasive terror neurotoxin and sulfuric, sulfuric acid and a corrosive electrolyte solution. So the purpose of this study is an elaboration of a mathematical approach for the prediction of battery scraps and consequently the potential of secondary lead production through the combination of battery lifespan and light, cars, uh, light car sales data using time series modeling. Uh, in the methodology, we divide in three steps. The first one is about lab lifespan. Um, the lab at the end of its service life were collected and the difference between the failure data and the data of manufacture was calculated for each battery. Four brands of batteries were analyzed with 384 samples for each brand in order to ensure a margin of error about 5%. So uh, we choose Recife in the table one. You can see you choose Recife uh, to collect this sample. Recife is a city in Brazil. And he chose this city because the percentual of the number of cars in the amount of motor vehicles, including motorcycles, uh, trucks, buses, is 96 percent 
so is the is basically the same person in Brazil. Uh, with this, the results that we find to we found to Recife, we can say that represents the Brazil two. And in the table two, we have the way that we found the number of samples. And the second step, we have the car sales and lifespan. Uh, uh, and in this section, we are dotting the assumption that the lifespan of a car is 10 years. And based on the data realized by Anfavia, Anfavia is uh, the entity that compromises the manufactured motors vehicles in Brazil. And we collected in Anfavia a data set containing the number of cars month by month over 10 years. And with this, uh, we indirectly determined determine, uh, the quantity of batteries on the market today in this type of vehicles. And Time, the time series models are designed to explore patterns in the past movements in order to forecast future behavior. Since the objective of this study was build short-term predictions model for the number of lab scrap, we use exponential smooth models. As proposed by Brown and Holt, this model is a forecast method that isolates seasonality from near irregular variation. Specific techniques of exponential smoothing assume that the extremes values of the series represent a random pattern. Thus, by smoothing these extremes, we can identify the basic pattern. Exponential smoothing assumes exponentially decreasing weights as data points become older. So, um, talking about the results, uh, in the first moment about the lab lifespan, as mentioned, 384 batteries from four different brands were collected in order to obtain the average, average lab lifespan. The results shown in the table three permit conclude that the average lab lifespan is three years. About the forecast model to battery scrap, because the time series forecast sales is non-stationary, the authors use moving average and hot winters multiplicative and additive models testing several parameters. The results recommended the use of hot winters multiplicative method with the level, trend, and seasonal equal 0 0.2 uh, for, the K, uh, for the car sales series due its small errors. And the results is here in the table four. Uh, and as you can see, we can see, we have the number of cars collected in the, uh, in the database of Anfavia beginning in 2009 until 2018. And using the model to time series, we forecast the number of cars entering in the market uh, beginning in two 2019 until 2023. So these new, car new cars have new batteries too. And knowing that every three years, this car will change uh, the batteries, we have the, uh, this number appearing again after three years with new batteries. So we have, uh, in this column, the total of new batteries entering in the market. And knowing that this new battery, after three years, will turn uh, scrap, we can found the, the quantity of scrap generation uh, in the years beginning in 2019 until 2023. So with this, we can uh, talk about the potential of secondary lead production. Using the data regarding of annual fleet and the average lifetime uh, of a brand of battery, and knowing that the new uh, cars and the old cars will be contributing with uh, scrap generation, uh, knowing that uh, one, one, one battery have an average nine kilograms of lead and in the process of recuperation we have loses around 4.5 percent 
we can uh, estimate the potential of lead recovery from lab scrap. And this result uh, is here in the table five, when we have uh, the lab scrap forecasting, the lead generation potential, and the lead recovery potential with the losses. So um, the results obtained in this study can be used as the basis of the decision making of specialist companies that work with lead uh, and gov government segment. It can help in sustainable waste management and planning uh, for lead recovery too. The model use has clear contributions for practical and research areas, providing critical information for lab scrap management process and estimating the potential for secondary lead, produ lead production favoring the coordination of economic and environmental management decisions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, João, for your presentation. Um, I would like to remind everyone about uh, the questions uh, you can send through the chat box. Uh, you can stop your screen share now, João. Okay, good. Yes. Um, and so, and now you can all send your questions to the chat box, like I mentioned, and in the end of all the presentations, we'll, we'll answer them. Uh, so now we go back uh, to try again with Verdu and Suita will will share her screen, yes. And Verdu, so you can start your presentation. Remember to unmute your microphone. There you go. Okay. You can start your presentation. Okay, thank you, Sweta, to see everybody. Um, hello? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And first off, uh, I'll talk to you about the impact of a 2005 on environment and human health. First, I'll thank you. Thank you. First, I'll talk about the impact of adrenaline sulfide. Slide, please. Slide, please. The impact of adrenaline sulfide. Uh, and the uh, measurement campaign wizard and discussion. Biogas related to biodegradable waste decomposition contain hydrogen sulfide, which are low concentration of physical danger on human health, exposure to high concentration wizard in the portion of the central nervous system, loads of consciousness, respiratory and other risks on human. Hydrogen sulfide is an asphyxiating gas, a toxic gas. It's also absorbed by the respiratory tract and by the tenders. The level concentration of hydrogen sulfide in the hair constitutes an olfactory nuisance. Exposure the high concentration of hydrogen sulfide may cause irritation of eyes, headache, dizziness, loss of consciousness. High concentration uh, can cause a long term illness for such hazards. Hydrogen sulfide in biogas is responsible, in biogas is responsible uh, for odor corrosivity and sulfur emission when burning gas. This picture shows us how hydrogen sulfide can attract on our lungs. On the other side, in the background of the slide, this is the left field. This is the picture, please. 
last speaking. On the other side, in the background of the land, there's a future land fit in Haiti. They were speaking to fire all over the side. This fire can accelerate the point of polluted to our own Next slide. To the dark side, composition of waves in Haiti. We at the left, we have the to the dark side. Next. And approximately, uh, approximately, to the dark side cover in a area of 252 hectares. It is near the ocean Atlantic at 690 meters on sea coast, which represents a danger for the ocean. The treated field is the open one called dark side. In operation, 35 years ago. It is located near of photo points table. On the other side, the composition of waste in Haiti. In Haiti, we have 55% of organic waste, 15 percent of plastic waste and 12 percent of paper waste, and the other are in the in a smaller proportion. Next, please. To maintain, to, to achieve the goal, and we decide to measurement the evolution of hydrogen sulfide in one wound the length field. Evolution of hydrogen sulfide concentration may identify a way of high concentration which length field worker or site visitor may be excluded. First, we use a many sensors at the left, we have the, the center. The center can measure the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and the temperature. And we have uh, at middle A, GPS. And on the right, we have the biogas measurement. We identify, to identify the concentration of gases in the vicinity of the landfill. We identify the measurable point. Firstly, we, in the, the, we identify the wheel of direction, the measurable point, and a point to make a continuous measurement. Next. Concentration. Next slide, please. Concentration of hydrogen sulfide. We observe a low concentration soon in the morning, a maximum around midday, following by a decrease during the afternoon. This observed here was suggest an experience of some type of energy on emission weight. And in the right, for Guadeloupe, uh, for in Guadeloupe, we measure the concentration of hydrogen sulfide. In Haiti, at City Landfill, we measure also the concentration of hydrogen sulfide. For both landfill, we found the concentration low at soon in the morning, the maximum at during the midday. The maximum concentration we found in Haiti is 11 ppm. In Guadeloupe, we, we have Seven ppm. Next slide, please. The, the concentration measure on the on on both length field are higher than the limit value of exposure to work. Hydrogen sulfide toxicity potential on eight area of work in Europe is five ppm. In America, one ppm. Of for three talent field, we find 11 ppm. And another length field in Guadeloupe, we found 7 ppm. 
hydrogen sulfide except the island in Europe and in America. Because we, we found one 11 ppm uh, for titanium film and 11 and 7 ppm for quadruplet film. Or the olfactory reason of hydrogen sulfide is 0 0.008 ppm. But at 0 0.008 ppm, the, the concentration of hydrogen sulfide gives anesthesia of smell above 100 ppm. Next one, please. But a plan, but a plan, the concentration. By it and the inverse method of flow model goes in for the atmospheric dispersion of polypeptide, it has with the following expression for hydrogen sulfide. Knowing the concentration of hydrogen sulfide, we decide to measure the emissivity of the hydrogen sulfide. And we, we measure the emissivity we, we we have the emissivity of hydrogen sulfide by a plan a inverse Gaussian model. We have for Gaussian model we have Gaussian model from we have Gaussian from model and Gaussian top model. This expression gives the emissivity of hydrogen sulfide in the vicinity of the job site. Q is the emissivity of hydrogen sulfide in kilogram per scum. C is the concentration of hydrogen sulfide in kilogram per cube meter. And we have the standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution in meter. Next slide, please. Radio, two minutes. Gaussian inverse model for two film. The result of a, when you apply Gaussian model. And up in the in the morning, we have a low emissivity of Gaussian model. And at noon, we have 0 0.8 emissivity, emissivity for hydrogen for hydrogen sulfide in the vicinity of TTLF. And during the afternoon. And uh, we have a low MCDD, we have a low MCDD from the long field. Next, please. Two, the MCDD is found from the major wind concentration in the wind direction. The MCDD is by, by the activity on the side. It's dipping of wind direction, wind speed, and concentration. The MCVD we find is the MCVD per one hectare, cause we divide, we divide it, the total MCVD by the area. Next slide, please. To reduce the impact of hydrogen sulfide on human health and environment, we support to to, put, to value, to recover with value the treatment of lengthy gas, treatment by with removal hydrogen sulfide. There are many ways to remove hydrogen sulfide from a gas field. For example, chemical processing, biological processing. And check in continuous air concentration and avoid it's released into the environment, the hydrogen sulfide. Thank you for your intention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rodeo, for, for your presentation. Um, so now um, we will have the last presentation by Rama Khalifa from Oman. Uh, but as she didn't have uh, access to the platform, we will record her video and later on we will we'll put together with the conference and share with everyone. 
So I would like to thank all the presenters for their very informative and interesting presentations. So now we come to the question and answer session. Um, so I have two questions here for Davis so far. Uh, just as a reminder, you who are listening, you can still send your question to either one of the presenters in the chat box, just uh, tell us your name, the question, and to who you, to whom you are um, asking. So, so Davis Cardiff asked, uh, "What are the inhibitors for larvae in food waste?" Oh, uh, yeah, inhibitors. The, I think uh, it is it is a question of if they are, the the food waste uh, has some inhibitors to larvae feeding, and what I would say is that um, food waste. Is considered as an ideal uh, as an ideal feed for the larvae because it has a lot of proteins, carbohydrates, and uh, lipids, and that's what the larvae uh, larvae actually require. But uh, unless they are, uh, 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 if if you find some food waste, they can be very rich in uh, the the food waste can be very rich in uh, fiber or uh, the ash content when doing nutrient uh, nutrient analysis. The ash the the ash content can be can be too high. And so if you get food waste, which has a lot of fiber and ash, then that will inhibit, will inhibit larvae feeding and hence it will be an inhibitor, an inhibitor, an inhibitor for larvae. So basically it's, uh, to, to conclude, uh, to summarize is that food waste is ideal because it has a lot of nutrients, but some of food waste as we have analyzed also contains a lot of fiber and uh, due to, because larvae do not have developed mouth parts, then the larvae won't feed in food waste, which has a lot of fiber, and then and that will be the only inhibitor in food waste. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for, for answering. We have another question for you. Um, yes. Do you think it is a good idea to mix sanitation waste with another bio-waste? If you consider the content of antibiotics, hormones, medicaments, is it not uh, better yeah, uh, oh, to okay. treat it separately? And why you don't use it? Um, are you planning using bio waste plant in a in a biogas station to get energy, and then compost di uh, digestate with other bio waste? Yeah, let me start with the with the with the biogas question. Uh, we are. Uh, we, we have very many ideas of treating bio waste and uh, biogas is one of them but in, in in the in the near future when we have we have done the organic waste treatment we are done with constructing the bio waste treatment facility uh, by using of a black soldier fly larvae and also the reason why we are not considering it uh, as a uh, as for now is that tariffs for producing uh, or, or tariffs for biogas in Kenya are not that conducive and so you might find yourself producing biogas, but you're not getting, it is very expensive. And so you're not getting, you'll not get, get revenue from that. And as being a, a, a company which is looking at trying to get profits from our processes, then the tariffs in Kenya would, would make us not, 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 not try to venture a lot into biogas production. The second question is about bio waste. Uh, in terms uh, co that is sanitation waste containing a lot of antibiotics, almost and uh, hormones and pre pre medicaments. That is, I think, waste from uh, uh, from human waste. And uh, I say we try to maintain our product specific specifications very high. We sterilize most of our like we, we sterilize our lab after harvesting through a very thorough process and. Uh, we have seen that most of the pathogens, if not uh, if not antibiotics, cannot be detected in the larvae after after sterilizing. Also, the larvae have been shown or have demonstrated in literature to do, to to or to break to break down organics, uh, and this uh, and most of these here that is the uh, most of the hormones and the antibiotics are organics and larvae are very strong in that. And then thirdly to that question is. 
currently there is no regulation limiting treatment of sanitation waste in in Kenya. So uh, we are we are currently uh, operating and working within 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 the law. Very good. Thank you so much, Davis. So now we have a question to Reem. Did I pronounce it correctly, Reem? Is it yes, Reem? yes, yes, Natalia, it's Reem. Uh, do private health institutions in Gaza have access to medical waste treatment sites? Because uh, Remy was asking because he knows the public hospitals have their own autoclaves, but uh, not sure if pri private businesses have them. Uh, before the new strategy, all the shards of, from all the medical health centers in Gaza disposing to the incinerators owned by the government in two incinerators. But many of them, there is no monitoring on the private uh, health institutions, so they just dispose their medical waste nor with the normal uh, solid waste. But after the new strategy, the autoclaves now is not owned by the public hospital or not owned even by one of the hospitals. The new strategy interferes a third party to take the responsibility of the health uh, or the medical waste uh, management. So even the government, they have a surface contract with the new third party and the private also institution shall have the surface contract with the third party to treat uh, their waste using the author. So this is the uh, new uh, strategy. So the government or the minister shall not take the responsibility of treating the medical waste. This is the new strategy to interfere a new body to take this responsibility to collect the medical waste from the centers to the treatment facility using only olive and then disposing in the sanitary landfills. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have another question for you from uh, Suri Shalini from India. Could you tell us about any legal aspects involved and in other disposal methods for medical waste other than autoclave? Uh, also, let us know about protective measures to be taken other than gloves or masks for collection of medical waste. Yes, sure. We have a law stated in 2012 uh, treating uh, regarding the medical waste in, in Palestine, not only in, in Gaza, and also talking about the other treatment facilities like uh, incinerators, autoclave, um, uh, chemical treatment, um, uh, capsulations, inertizations, different techniques. But in Gaza, we have only the two incinerators and these uh, three incinerators now, and one autoclave. The incinerators are owned by the government inside the hospital, used only for sharps, but the autoclave now dealing with the infectious and sharps, not only for uh, the sharps. So we have, of course, stated in the legal or in the law, uh, other treatment facilities, but what is existed now in Gaza is the uh, autoclave and incinerator, and we are expecting to have a new treatment facility interfere in Gaza in the this year, at the end of this year with Kruev, but we are now in the tendering process. But regarding the, the second questions, uh, the protective measurements, uh, yes, of course, not only the personal protection, not only the apron and the gloves and the mask, uh, also, the strategy uh, having new vehicles uh, for the transportation um, accommodated with uh, what was required in the law, like covering the vehicle uh, inside with the um, protective layers and only used for the medical waste, not used with the other uh, types of the waste, like using the, to transport the salt waste, it's only for the medical waste. And the cabin for, transport, for transporting is separated from the uh, drivers. So, and also in the treatment facilities, uh, so many protective measurements, it's totally closed uh, and there is uh, a separated collection from uh, the leachate and there is a ventilation system. So other than the uh, personal protective equipment, but the study was targeting not the off-site management, but targeting only the intra-hospital management. That's why I was talking about the intra-management inside the medical institutions. Okay, thank you so much, Irene. Thank you. So much, thank you. Um, so, so now we 
<clears throat> we have extended uh, the time for a conference. We have come to the end of the first day. I would like to thank very much all the participants for the great presentations and a big thank you for the audience from around the world who have joined. The slides and the recording of the conference will be shared with you all uh, later uh, by email. And all the presenters will get the certificates uh, also by email and their abstracts will be published in the conference book, which will be avail available in the YPG website soon. So uh, just to remind you guys, uh, tomorrow we have the second day at 4 a.m. GMT uh, of this conference. Please join us if you can. And uh, the best three presenters of, uh, of our conference will be announced in mid-September and they'll be contacted by email. The winners of the, at the conference uh, will get the free entry to the ISVA Congress in Bilbao in October and up to 300 uh, pounds of funding to travel. So again, I would really like to thank you all for your participation, for coming, um, sorry, it was euros, not uh, pounds. Uh, so thank you so much for, for, for coming today. I, would, I hope that uh, you guys can come tomorrow and I hope that uh, from this is your first uh, participation and, and you, can, you can participate more in the YPG, in our activities, in our projects, uh, like Rami mentioned. You're all welcome to participate. So uh, I would also really like to thank uh, Suita from uh, Be Waste Wise. Uh, you've been uh, really great. Thank you so much for this partnership. And uh, and so now I close the session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>
To sum it up, we aim to reduce, reuse, recycle, recover, and dispose the least amount of waste in our existing landfills. Why is that? To achieve sustainable development. And here comes the Sun, Peace and Love, the Environmental Center of Excellence, with a team of young professionals under the age of 35, except the boss, you know. He's not old though, he's just 39 years old. The center's vision is to lead the sustainable development revolution in the country and has four departments, uh, which are research and development, environmental data management, technology assessment and commercialization, and BA Academy. We aim at shifting from linear model of business, which consumes and wastes resources, and that is not sustainability, to circular economy concept in the country. And we believe that change starts within. So all employees at my company are using reusable glass bottles, which results in avoiding around 300,000 plastic bottles just in 2018. Uh, that's equal to a total carbon, a carbon footprint equal to 9.9 uh, .9 million gram. Also, paper cups will no longer be used for tea or coffee at workplace. Such action will lead to avoid cutting down 24 trees and around uh, 3 million gram of CO2 emissions. We are conducting a couple of R&D projects to achieve our divergent strategy and um, sustainable development in the country, like surveying the bio-waste quantities for our biogas plants and uh, end-of-life uh, tires generation to process them to be used as fuel in our cement industry. Uh, also, establishment of Rio Center at the biggest Omani University uh, aims to mirror the ecosystem that leaves nothing wasted. Everything from clothing to household items to electronics and tools have a purpose and an afterlife purpose. So that traditional waste can be something useful to others or in another form. Also, we have a local R&D project on conserving the Egyptian vultures and international collaboration with Air Liquide to convert CO2 and methane to energy. We know that inspiring the young minds is essential to create sustainable world. And here are some short clips that represent our education and awareness programs to conserve the environment of Oman and definitely uh, the uh, whole planet. So we have cleaning campaigns on and offshore. We are also reusing end of life tires and fishing nets to construct football goals at our beaches. We are also converting plastics or reusing plastics uh, and turn them to artwork, music instruments and games. So we started small, started smart, and now we're watching it go big to serve Oman and to conserve its environment. Thank you.